Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And hit that bell, fam. Caught in the Cannabis, a Freeman Perspective. As I was reading from here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century by Dr. A. Kirsten Mullen and Dr. William A. Darity Jr., I noticed a brutal comparison from our Freeman ancestors being locked out of land to the current entry into the cannabis industry. Edward Philbrick, head of the Boston Concern, a consortium of northern investors that organized to take advantage of the government's land auctions, publicly identified as an abolitionist while contending that blacks were not ready for the responsibilities of land ownership. For him, the Port Royal blacks regarded their change of condition with fear and trembling. Looking at the cotton field as a lifelong scene of the unrequited toil, inhaling with delight the prospect of no more driver, no more cotton, no more licking. Without the benefit of whites to drive and threaten them with the lash, the former slaves were unreliable farm workers in his eyes. It was all well and good that blacks become an industrious and useful laboring class, Philbrook said, but land ownership, at least ownership achieved through a government program based on the premise that granting land to formerly enslaved blacks was one critical step to the right, the wrongs of slavery, was not in the country's best interest. Philbrook's group, not the ex-slaves, purchased nearly half of the 16,479 acres of Port Royal land auctioned by the government under the Direct Tax Act in 1863. The group bought it at the unbelievable low average price of less than $1 per acre and cultivated cotton crops using laborers drawn from the freedmen's population who were supervised by several former federal plantation supervisors. Philbrook exploited what was intended to be a land reform strategy and economic boost for the contraband. His effrontery and crassness cost the formerly enslaved about 205 homesteads at 40 acres apiece. Of course, there was no presumption that the productivity of Philbrook and his white partners would be harmed by the opportunity to purchase large parcels of confiscated land at below market prices. Freedmen, on the other hand, allegedly would be corrupted morally by such largest, made soft and unsuitable for work. Better for northern capital, quote, end quote, to own the sea islands than for it to be abandoned to the Negroes and wild hogs. There is no doubt that the northern capital in the hands of Edward Philbrick turned a huge profit on the expensively purchased land or inexpensively purchased land from the cotton crop raised by the former slaves. Philbrick's private correspondence and his public affairs lend grounds for skepticism about the sincerity of his philanthropic intentions. The former slaves were paid by the job system. In principle, 16,000 black Port Royal farmers were eligible to purchase 40,000 acres of land at the rate of $1.25 per acre. Claude F. Aubrey reports that a single black collector purchased the land they were working, some 470 acres, at $7 per acre. Although Lincoln instructed the Treasury Department to offer black families who had lived in the Sea Islands before the war 40 acre plots at $1.25 with 40% down, individuals over the age of 21 were eligible to purchase 20 acres. Secretary Chase delayed the sale and then allowed ineligible whites to purchase the majority of the land for an average of $11 per acre. Advocates of black land ownership included a contributor to the Liberator, the anti-slavery newspaper who wrote from Port Royal in January 1864. Quote, if large sums of money can be made at cotton growing, why should not these ex-slaves who have served so long and painful an apprenticeship at this business now that they should be attaining to their majority, bear their share of this business, and thus gather up for themselves some of the ordinary comforts of life, and use their surplus earnings to help on their civil, economical, and educational interests. Now, let's bring it up to the modern era. According to an Insider.com article, the legal cannabis industry is exploding, but overwhelmingly run by white owners. In 2018, over 600,000 people in the United States were charged for possessing marijuana, not for running some massive weed drug cartel, for simply having it on them. 
And despite making up only 31% of the population, blacks and Latinos accounted for nearly half of all weed arrests. The same time the US cannabis industry was and still is exploding and between 80% to 90% of the industry is run by white owners. So not only are blacks and Latinos more likely to get in trouble for selling and having weed, now that it's becoming legal, they're nearly shut out of the industry. Somewhere along the line, legal weed became a rich white business. As of 2023, there are 21 states along with Washington DC in Guam that have acted to legalize recreational marijuana. Yet, there's a tale of two countries, racially targeted arrests in the era of marijuana reform. This ACLU research report, a tale of two countries racially targeted arrests in the era of marijuana reform, details marijuana arrests from 2010 to 2018 and examines racial disparities at the national, state, and county levels. Updating our previous report, The War on Marijuana in Black and White, that examined arrests from 2000 to 2000 and 2010, this report reveals that the racist war on marijuana is far from over. More than 6 million arrests occurred between 2010 and 2018, and black people are still more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than white people in every state, including those that have legalized marijuana. With detailed recommendations for governments and law enforcement agencies, this report provides a detailed roadmap for ending the war on marijuana and ensuring legalization efforts center racial justice. Blacks are 3.73 times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana. I don't know about you family, but I am tired of this whole bootstrapping narrative that tends to play out, especially by the dominant society on freedmen people. And especially when freedmen people start to interject and regurgitate what the dominant society says. I mean, it's crazy when you think about how hard it is and how much money up front you have to have to come up with this investment. I mean, this is nuts, family. I mean, check this out, right? If you live in California and you want to open a, a dispensary, in California, you'll pay $1,000 to apply for a dispensary license. And if approved, you'll pay a license in between $4,000 and $120,000. The average upfront investment to open a dispensary in California is between $80,000 and $250,000. Ongoing operating expenses will cost you between $30,000 and $70,000 each month. Yeah, go back to your uh, money tree and go get that money, fam. You go do that. Let's check out Massachusetts, shall we? The estimated upfront cost of opening a dispensary in Massachusetts can range between $325,000 and $1 million. One milli. One milli, fam. One milli. Ongoing operational expenses like employee salaries and lease or mortgage payments will average around $70,000 to $100,000 per month. So once again, family, I'm sure if y'all got a, a wealthy, rich relative, go to them and say, hey, family, I need about a mil right off the top. Good luck with that. But regardless, once again, Freedmen, we must understand where we're at. And I know a lot of y'all who are listening to this, I know y'all know, but we have to keep pushing this narrative. We have to keep pushing this message. And our allies have to keep pushing this message because we have been bottom casted and bottom classed since we first landed here on American soil. That's it, family. Be safe, be blessed. Please like, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell. Until the next time, peace and reparations.